Well, for the last video for the main part of chapter 10, we're going to look at some performance measurements. And here we have an overhead performance report. And it may look intimidating at first, but it really isn't. Let's just follow along and see what we have here. Under this first column, cost formula, this is per direct labor hour, we have our variable overhead cost components, indirect labor, lubricants, and power. And we see that our total variable overhead cost is $3 per direct labor hour. So these are costs that we figured that during the course of operations should vary by this much per every direct labor hour. Our first column represents our actual costs that we incurred for the month based on 5,400 direct labor hours that we actually incurred. So here are our variable costs broken down per cost component, indirect labor, lubricants, and power, total variable overhead costs, and below it we have our fixed overhead costs, depreciation, supervisory salaries, and insurance, for total overhead cost of 42890 So far, so good. We're going to take this one column at a time. In the next column, what we've decided to do was we have a budget based on 5,400 direct labor hours. Since we incurred 5,400, let's do a budget for 5,400 labor hours to see how far off we are from that level of activity. Remember flexible budgeting, right? So we'll take the 5,400 and we'll multiply it by each of these cost components. These are standard costs. And this is what we should have spent if our standards came in in line. So we should have spent 16.2. We only spent 15,390, so we came in under budget. And we record what our budgeted fixed costs are. Now these are independent of the amount of hours we work. Look, the first one is depreciation. Depreciation doesn't depend on 5,400 direct hours or 5,000. It doesn't depend on anything. Supervisory salary should not depend on the amount of hours that are worked. And same with insurance, it should not. So we, we budget for $25,000 of fixed expenses. We actually spent twenty-seven five. dollars So what is going on here? We're not quite sure. The third column is saying, OK, great. You have your 5,400 actual hours based on your standard costs. But given the level of output that we produced, we really should have only incurred 5,000 direct labor hours, not 5,400. So Based on our output, these are the costs we should have incurred. 15,000 in variable. And look at this, 25,000 in fixed. Notice that going from 5,400 to 5,000 on the budget, our fixed costs do not change. They stay the same because we expect them to stay the same. So that's the first three columns. That should be fairly easy. Notice that column one is our actual quantity times our actual cost. Column two is our actual quantity times a standard cost. And column three is a standard quantity times a standard cost. We've seen this throughout the chapter for direct materials, direct labor, and the variable manufacturing overhead. That means something for the variable manufacturing overhead component of this, but not for the fixed component. So let's follow this through. Notice column one minus column three. Column one minus column three is our total flexible budget variance, as it is, as we've seen before. One minus three, actual, actual, minus standard, standard. And that gives us a total unfavorable variance of 390. But we know that we can break that down into a spending variance, which is actual, actual, minus actual, standard. And we can break it down into efficiency variance, which is actual standard minus standard standard. Now, notice that this spending variance measures our spending, the actual dollars we part with. And in each of these, for indirect labor, for lubricants, and for power, we parted with fewer dollars in variable overhead than we thought, 810. But we have a $1,200 unfavorable efficiency variance. Well, where does that come from? It comes from this. Look, we used 5,400 direct labor hours. Multiplied by the standard costs gives us what we should have spent for that level of volume. However, 
given the output that we had, we should have only used 5,000 direct labor hours. So the difference of 400 direct labor hours. Well, 400 times a dollar 50 is 600. 400 times a dollar is 400. And 400 times 50 cents is 200. So this 1,200 is just what what we what would the difference between the amount of hours that we used and the amount of hours we should have used so this 1200 unfavorable tells us that we are inefficient in our use of direct labor hours we're inefficient because our output dictates that we should have used 5000 but we used 5400 so this is really an unfavorable amount relating to the efficient use of direct labor. But here's the deal. We had 5,400 direct labor hours. However, we apply overhead based on the standard. So we're applying 5,000 times 3. So in other words, this 15,000 over here is what we're going to apply. Unfortunately, Based on 5,400 hours, we should have applied 16.2. So that 1,200 just tells us that we under-applied. And under-applied is unfavorable. There's the U. Let's go down to our fixed costs. Now that we understand this, let's go down to our fixed costs. And let's look at our budget variance in brackets. The spending variance relates to the variable. The bracket, the budget variance, relates to the fixed. When we look at our actual versus our budget, we can see that we have some unfavorable variances here. We spent actual cash leaving the business now, 2,000 more for supervisory salaries and 500 more for insurance for a total of 2,500. Notice we have nothing here under, under the volume variance. Why? Because if we do a budget for 5,400 hours, we expect our fixed costs to come in line at 25,000. If we do a budget for 5,000, we expect our fixed costs to come in line at 25. In fact, any budget in between 5,400 and 5,000 that we can think of, 5,350, 5,200, 5,150, would have the same fixed costs. So that our volume variance would show zero based on the budget that we're using, not based on what we've applied. I hope we understand that. So this is, this is just budgets. And so we find that we have a $2,500 unfavorable budget variance, which is what we should have had, a $2,500 unfavorable budget variance. So this draws our attention to the fact that we need to investigate these components. That's what the performance report will do. Here's the question that we end with. Well, given all of these components, which ones do we investigate? Are these big enough to warrant investigation? In other words, could these variances not have been generated just by random fluctuations alone? And that there's really nothing wrong, it's just that, hey, listen, in any given month, you're going to be a little over or a little under. You're never going to be exact. There's going to be some natural normal variation in your output. Some months have 31 days, remember? Some months have 28 days, but when we take our annual costs, we divide by 12. So February might have a different result than March, because February has 28 days, March has 31 days. So it just could be something silly like that that causes these small random fluctuations. The question we end with is, okay, now that we can see all the unfavorable and favorable amounts, which ones are really worth investigating and which ones aren't? So to help us decide which variances are worth investigating, we can look at the different measures of variance and determine which one we want to have a rule for. We can look at the absolute dollar size of the variance, and we can have a rule that says we will investigate all variances over a certain dollar amount. That doesn't really work out very well because you might set one at a million and uh, the total costs are a hundred million. That's insignificant, right? So we can look at relative size instead. This is a percentage of the total. Anything over some percentage, anything over 3% variance. So if our, we expect to spend $10,000 and we have a variance of 200, it's under 3%. We can ignore it. 
We can also look at statistical size. And we can investigate any variance that's greater or less than some standard deviation away from zero. So what that looks like is this. Let's uh, make a zero line right here, and that's our zero line. And we have different costs that come in. Our variance is uh, greater than zero or less than zero, and we can plot them over time. And over time, it'll allow us to develop an estimate of what the standard deviation is. And we can draw our lines of one standard deviation above zero and one standard deviation below zero. And anything outside of that would uh, require attention. Anything less than that, we would argue that, you know what, that's just normal statistical variation. We're probably wasting our time investigating it. Now, moving away from the investigation of variances, to take a bigger picture of everything that we've done, we can engage in something called capacity analysis. And this allows us to tell us how well we're utilizing all of our resources. And we need different capacity levels. There's one level called theoretical capacity, which assumes 24 hours operation, 7 days a week, 365 days a year with no downtime. Not realistic. Not very practical. So, we have practical capacity. And practical capacity is our theoretical capacity. Once we figure out what our theoretical capacity is based on the equipment, the machines, and everything in the size that we have, that's, that's fairly straightforward. Less unavoidable downtime. What's an unavoidable downtime? Let's say a wicked blizzard hits. Six feet of snow, nobody can get to work. Well, you're not doing anything that day. Nobody can get to work, but that's unavoidable, right? Other things like maintenance, breakdowns, setup times that are required. You don't just move from one product to another product without setting up the machines or cleaning the machines or even fixing it, fixing it for normal wear and tear. So you need some assumptions as to what unavoidable downtime is, and we can come up with an estimate of practical capacity. Based on our budget, we also have something called the denominator level of capacity. How much we expect at the beginning of the year, how much we expect to do in operating income. This is capacity that's budgeted for. Against all of those, we have our actual capacity. And our actual capacity is the capacity actually used. So if we put theoretical capacity at 100%, which is unachievable, and practical capacity at 80%, our actual capacity will be some percentage of theoretical, and we can use it to compare against all the other levels. How do we get there? Well, for each of the levels, theoretical, practical, denominator level, and actual capacity, we need a measure of total manufacturing overhead costs. And remember, our total manufacturing overhead costs are made up of a variable component to, to our predetermined overhead rate, our direct labor hours times our variable predetermined overhead rate, plus our fixed costs. So our total manufacturing overhead costs will be different at every level. They'll be much higher at the theoretical level than they are at the practical level, and so on. So there's our total manufacturing overhead. That's step one. Step two is for each of the capacity levels, theoretical, practical, denominator level, and actual, we're going to calculate an operating income. See, you first had to figure out what your total manufacturing costs are. First, your total manufacturing overhead before you can calculate the operating income because they'll be different at each level, right? So, it is our contribution margin minus our total manufacturing overhead. And in this case, our contribution margin is only our sales minus our direct materials minus our direct labor. Because in total manufacturing overhead, we put the variable component of manufacturing overhead in there. So it's our contribution minus our total manufacturing overhead. We'll come up with a measure of operating income at each of these levels of capacity. Then we can take our actual operating uh, income, the actual operating income that we, uh, that we achieve, and we can compare that with the theoretical level. We can compare it with the practical level. And we can compare it with the denominator level of activity. Mm -hmm.